good afternoon. And uh, thank you for being here and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the thing, one of the things that interests me very particularly, and that is where our moral motivation comes from. Where do our moral values and our moral ideas come from? If, for example, you were to notice me walking around outside on a very cold winter day with no shoes, I'm guessing that you would be motivated to help me in some way. But why do you care? Why do I care to put out the effort to recycle cans and plastic bottles? After all, I'm not likely to be around when the disaster comes from climate change. Or why should we care about the extinction, say, of elephants? And yet, many of us do. So the question is really where that motor, moral motivation comes from. Now, moral decisions come, of course, in many shapes and many sizes. Some of them are very small, as, for example, when somebody helps another person lift their suitcase into the overhead bin on the airplane. They can also be really quite mo uh, monumental and consequential. As for example, if you decide uh, to go and work in a clinical center that treats people with Ebola virus. People will undertake to do really quite remarkable things for others. Now, before going on a little bit further, I should just say that I'm going to mean something fairly simple by moral in this context. I mean that an individual will incur a cost to themselves in order to benefit another. Sometimes they might get some benefit out of it too, but there is a cost. Perhaps the cost is in terms of use of energy or use of time, sacrificing opportunities, and so forth. But it is thought to be distinctly different to care for others and to incur a cost to yourself as opposed to acting always selfishly. Now, we do, of course, know that all animals, all of us, as well as all mammals, all reptiles, frogs, fish, have the nervous structures in their system to take care of themselves. They have a or neural organization that helps them see to their own food, their safety, and their warmth. And of course, this is a kind of obvious biological fact. and We understand it very well in the, in the light of biological evolution. And that's because any animal that lacks the circuitry to see to its own self-survival will not reproduce and pass on its genes. It will become somebody else's lunch. And so the question is, how is it that all of us including other mammals, are able and not only just willing with effort, but are highly motivated to care for another. Now, a very common approach that has some merit is that religion is sort of the fountainhead of moral norms, moral values, and moral motivation. And according to this view, then, children need to be taught religions in order to acquire the appropriate moral framework. The difficulty with this view really is that humans, <coughs> excuse me, humans have been on the planet for about a quarter of a million years. But it's only within the last 10,000 years, with the advent of agriculture, and hence getting stable towns and stable communities, that we see the emergence of organized religions. In hunter-gatherer groups for most of the history of humankind, and even now hunter-gatherer groups, tend not by and large to have the idea of a god the lawgiver, a god the punisher. Anthropologists have speculated that with the advent of large communities where not everyone knew everyone else, that it turned out to be rather useful to have a priest class that would enforce the existing moral norms. And the priest class found it useful to develop the idea of an unseen lawgiver 
who, when you were off by yourself and perhaps contemplating a certain kind of action, might be deterred. And I will go to the next slide. And so we see the emergence of what actually turns out to be a rather powerful idea, and that is that there is an unseen presence who is a kind of special lawgiver and who will punish you uh, for misdeeds. But it's important to see that this idea is not the fountainhead of religion. It really built on what was already in place. And we know, for example, from existing Inuit groups who live in the Arctic, that they have very significant and in some instances sophisticated ideas about moral lives. They care for each other, they share, they have norms about deceit, norms about who should lead the, the group in hunting, and so forth. So the basic moral platform didn't seem to arise from religions, whereas religions seem to have built upon it. So our question then is still, so where does moral motivation come from? Why is it so powerful in our lives and in our decision making? This rather surprising answer is that sociality in birds and mammals emerged in evolution really as a response to an issue about food. And altruism and getting along turned out to be a kind of byproduct, albeit a very useful byproduct. So here's the story. About 200 million years ago, homeotherms appeared on the planet. Homeotherm is a warm-blooded animal. And this was a terrific genetic change because it allowed the animals to forage at night when the other guys had to sleep because they had to wait for the sun to come up. And it allowed them to live in colder climates where uh, they could manage through their homeothermy to keep themselves warm. Now, although it was a great advantage, there was a disadvantage. And that is that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as his cold-blooded cousins. And that is a huge ecological pressure. Now, one way that there could be genetic changes to respond to that pressure is to make animals smart. Now, through various kinds of genetic changes, you could achieve that. And here would be one, make a whole lot more neurons and have them organized in a certain kind of way. And, but the second part is in a way more important. And that is, okay, fine, make a whole lot more neurons, but schedule it so that those neurons grow at the right time, namely after the animal is born, so that this neural network that you've built will tune itself up to the causal structure of the world. And so that is basically what happened, is the old mechanisms for learning were scaled up massively, and you get this wonderful big learning effect. However, all is not roses. Because one of the difficulties of being born very immature is that you're vulnerable, you're dependent. So a little turtle might be born, will come out of its egg, scuttle off to the ocean, it won't learn much in its lifetime, but it's independent when born. Whereas a rat pup is completely dependent when it's born. The best it can do is sort of struggle along, find something warm and suck on it. But then it learns prodigiously. So big learning turned out uh, to be amazingly powerful. But what are you going to do about these vulnerable babies that are going to be smart? And the answer is rig it so that a smart adult takes care of them. The long and short of the story here is that it seems that some very old structures, including this old neurochemical peptide, body chemical, was replaced into the brain of mammals and we got a very different effect along with some other changes in circuitry. So what was the effect? The effect was really quite astonishing. It meant that this smart adult 
took care of this vulnerable, about to be smart, offspring. In other words, it organized and structured the bonding between parents and offspring. An amazing change that took us then from self-care and self-oriented values to other-oriented values. Essentially, what you can think of, excuse me, just one minute. Essentially, the way to think of this is that the sort of ambit of me, simply by virtue of this wiring change, got extended to me and mine. And so just as the mother rat takes care of her own food and water and safety, she takes care of that as of the baby. So by virtue of the circuitry and the neurochemicals, baby and mother are tightly bonded. They care for each other now. The pleasure system is engaged when they're together, and probably the endogenous opioids that your brain makes are a big factor here that make you feel good when you're together, and you feel pain when you're separated, both mother uh, and baby. And so it looks like the basis for sociality really had to do with food in the last analysis, but the big problem was solved by having big learning and having vulnerable infants that were cared for. So now you might want to know, um, that's all very well. It's a story about mothers and offspring. But how do we get to what we might consider recognizably moral, where individuals take care of another, share, take a real cost to themselves? And uh, we know, of course, that there are many, many different species of social birds and mammals. And they operate in somewhat different ways. But the huge clue for us came from a remarkable rodent, the prairie vole. Now, I'll show you what a vole looks like. So there are many species of voles. The montane voles are kind of like what you expect. At maturity, the male and the female meet, they mate, and they go on their separate ways. In prairie voles, they meet, they mate, and they're bonded for life. And so the question was, what's the difference in the brain? Now, by bonded for life, I mean that the male guards the nest, he helps take care of the babies, they're distressed uh, when they're separated, and most of the reproductive action takes place between the two. And there are other mammalian species, TT monkeys, for example, California deer mice, that also show this kind of monogamous behavior. What's the difference in the brain between montane voles and prairie voles? Well, after a few false starts, it turned out that oxytocin, which is very important for bonding between mother and offspring, is also important for bonding between mates. It just depends on where receptors for oxytocin are. Now, a receptor sits on a nerve cell, the oxytocin binds to it, and changes how the neuron responds. And so by distributing receptors and oxytocin in very particular parts of the reward system and the old motivational system, you get long-term bonding between mates, or you may get, as in baboons, very tight bonding uh, within a family, and, uh, but not bonding between mates. And so we see a variety of kinds of sociality in mammals and birds that depends very much on the ecological conditions um, in which those animals evolved. So that gives you the basic story of where motiv motivation for moral decision making comes from. But of course, we also have norms. And it turns out that, again, a very ancient part of the brain interacts with the very new part of the brain, the cortex, in such a way that children pick up the norms of their group in a very natural way. Now, as we know, social inclusion is a very positive and rewarding experience. Social exclusion is very painful. And just those things will help 
a child, a dog, a rat, a cow, a horse, to learn and acquire the norms of its group. So learning social habits and social skills is a very, very important part of moral functioning within a social group. And one of the things that happens, and it seems to happen particularly in humans, is that there can be a very rewarding aspect to cooperation. If two kids cooperate and they manage to achieve something they couldn't on their own, it's very rewarding. And so cooperation comes to be the sort of go-to solution when people have very particular kinds of causal problems or kinds of social problems that they need to solve. Imitation is one way in which we all pick up the norms of our group, but sometimes we also do it by hearing stories, watching movies, and as long as we uh, can imagine humans going back in time, they appear to have sat around fires and told one another stories about successes and failures that could be taken in uh, as part of the normative structure. But these norms are learned and are remembered so vividly only because they are the kind of superstructure on this basic moral platform that depends on the opioids, these natural opioids that your own brain makes, and on oxytocin. I should perhaps just mention also that one of the things that oxytocin does is increases in levels of oxytocin tend to decrease levels of stress hormones. And that does feel moderately good. We all know that when you're anxious and your stress levels are high, it's uncomfortable. You want to change things. So stranger comes into camp, your stress levels are high. Who is this guy? What's he going to do? Well, he begins to show himself to be socially appropriate. He doesn't do anything scary. Pretty soon you begin to have a natural conversation. Stress hormones lower and oxytocin levels tend to go up. In something like this pattern, this basic platform for social motivation that involves bonding strongly to others and providing the basis for a superstructure of norms that reflect how your group best functions, internalizing all of that is something like what you might call a conscience. And while I think neuroscience still has many questions about sociality and morality that we can answer, we're not going to be able to answer particular moral questions. Neuroscience is not going to be able to say whether or not it's moral to use a drone to strike a terrorist camp somewhere in the world. Neuroscience is not going to be able to weigh in on whether a flat tax is more appropriate than a graduated income tax. We're probably going to have to continue to address specific moral issues in the way that humans always have. We talk it over, we negotiate, we hear the other side, we reflect on it, we use good common sense and goodwill and hope for the best. Namaste. Thank you.